The theory of torsion that we've developed up to this point applies to bars that have circular cross sections. They can be solid or hollow, but the net cross section always has to be circular in nature. And one of the things, the reasons for that is that if you have a non-circular cross section, then you have something known as warping of the cross section. So in our kinematic assumption for the circular case, you had this situation where the cross section rotated as a rigid body and, and plane sections remained plane. If you have a bar that's non-torsion, so for example a, a square bar and you twist it, uh, the cross sections, if you, if you look at them, they, they move in the Z direction. So as shown here in green, they kind of move up and down. They're no longer flat. Okay, so you have Z, UZ being non-equal to zero. And this situation is not too hard to solve, but it's certainly a fair bit harder than what we've been doing. And in particular, it requires the solution to partial differential equations to be able to solve it. Uh, and the theory that's used to solve those types of problems is known as St. Fanon torsion. It, it comes down to solving Poisson's equation. So it's not a hard equation to solve, but it's also not particularly easy unless the cross-sectional shape is, is rather simple. Okay, But there happens to be one special case that we can treat easily, and that's the case that I'd like to look at now. So I want to consider bars under the action of torsion, but who have cross sections that can be called what is, or termed what is known as thin-walled. So I've, I've drawn a, a picture of one thin-walled uh, bar here, or tube as it's normally called. So I have a prism, it's got a triangular cross section, but it's hollow. And the way we're going to define the geometry of, of the cross section is we define it by r as a function of alpha. Alpha is an angular coordinate measured from uh, the x-axis. So the, the origin of the x-y-axis here is at the center of rotation of the cross section. And r just simply measures position to the wall as a function of alpha. And at each value of alpha, I also have a thickness, t. And when I say that the cross-section is thin-walled, what I mean is that the ratio of r to t is always going to be greater than 10. Okay, so that's the meaning of thin-walled. And this actually allows us to construct a theory uh, that works for non-circular cross-sections, so a special case, thin-walled. Okay? And, and the way it's done is that instead of using a kinematic assumption, we're going to use a thinness assumption. That's why we, we're talking about thin-walled here in this setup. So, when I, when I twist a tube of this nature, uh, say with this triangular cross section, I'm going to have warping, so my assumption that gamma is equal to r d phi d z is not going to hold, but I can use the fact that the wall is thin to come up with a rather nice assumption that will actually allow me to understand the behavior of such systems. In particular, we're going to assume that the stresses are constant across the wall thickness. So we have a, a thin wall, say, going from point A to B, and we assume the distance from A to B here is small, and namely that the stresses at A are going to be the same as the stresses at B. Uh, let me introduce a couple of other things here. Uh, we'll also introduce the arc length along the length of the tube, so it's going to start at where the x-axis intersects the tube, so I'll be s equals zero, so s will be my arc length parameter, and it's just simply going to increase as I go around the tube. Uh, in a counterclockwise fashion. Uh, the normal vector to the tube we'll call En, and the tangential vector to the tube we'll call Es. So these are just some uh, notation conve notational conventions that we're going to use in trying to develop our theory here. So let's first consider equilibrium of the tube. So I'll draw my standard picture looking at the side. So we could have distributed torques along the length of the tube. Uh, and we could have, say, an end torque, maybe one end is built in. None of the, uh, the assumptions that we used or the steps we used in deriving the equilibrium equation for the circular tube are violated when you have a thin tube. So if you have a thin tube, we're actually going to have the exact same equilibrium equation that we had for a solid circular tube. So thin wall tubes have the same equilibrium, dt dz plus little t equals zero. So there's no changes here. Uh, for the equilibrium when we look at thin wall tubes. Now, if we try and connect the internal torque T to the shear stresses, things are going to look a little different. So here I've drawn my triangular tube. I've sectioned it, uh, or pulled out a section of length L from the tube. And I've also made a horizontal slice 
through my free body diagram here. And I've drawn the stresses here in, a, in as red. So we'll have shear stresses. Uh, if I put subscripts on them, the section cut is with normal Z. So I'm going to have tau Z, or sigma Z. To, and the stresses are in the tangential direction. So that will be S. So tau Z, S are the shear stresses on the cross section. And I've made this horizontal cut and drawn the shear stresses on the horizontal cut, too. And just like we had with the shear stresses when we were looking at Cartesian coordinates, the, the shear stresses on orthogonal planes will still be equal to each other. So I know that tau ZS is equal to tau SZ. So the shear stress on, on the top face is going to be tau ZS also as a function of position. So the section cut here is made, say, with respect to an angle alpha 2. and this one here is made with an angle, say, alpha 1 there. And so there's a different value, tau ZS alpha 1. And on the top and the bottom faces of these horizontal cuts, I have the exact same shear stress. So what I can do is, if I want, I can sum the forces on this free body diagram in the Z direction. Well, the Z direction, the only forces are going to come from the top face here and the top face here. Okay, so, and that stress is going to be looking at Face 1 here is going to be tau ZS alpha 1 times the thickness at alpha 1 times the length of my piece. So that's stress times area gives me force. And then on this face over here, let's call it face 2. This one we'll call face 1, where we have alpha 2. I'm going to have the shear stress there, tau ZS of alpha 2 times T at alpha 2 times the length. So that's force equilibrium some of the forces in the z direction equals zero. And over here I have the end view of this, so I have a force coming out at me, and I have a force going away from me there. Actually, I guess I have that reversed according to my diagram. At alpha 1, it's going away from me, and at alpha 2, it's coming at me. Okay, But notwithstanding, if you look at this relationship here, I can count, I can cancel the L's, and I have tau at alpha 1 times the thickness at alpha 1 is equal to tau at alpha 2 times the thickness at alpha 2. So I've dropped the subscripts since there's only one shear stress in the problem. And so what I find out is that the product of the shear stress times the thickness is independent of where I make the section cut. I could make it at alpha 1, I could make it at alpha 2, I always get the same result. So tau times t no matter what alpha is, is always going to be a constant. And by convention, we call that constant Q, and it has a name. It's called the shear flow in the system. And that's a very important property. It comes to us by the thinness assumption, whereby we assume that the shear stresses are constant across the thickness. And that allows us then to do simple calculations to determine the forces on various surfaces. OK, so let's move a little bit forward and see if we can connect now the shear flow to the torque. Let me start with the general relationship between the torque on the cross section and the shear stresses. So the general relationship between the torque and the stresses is the torque acting along the z-axis is the position vector cross product with the traction vector uh, integrated over the area here. And so the traction vector is sigma transpose times the normal, which is Ez. And let me go ahead and first expand out the expression for the position vector. That's just the radial distance times the radial unit vector. And my traction on my surface is the shear stress, that's my tau ZS, times the tangential direction. So the, the shear stresses are pointing in the tangential direction. And for dA, I'm going to break dA up into two parts. There's integration across the thickness and integration along the arc length. Okay, so this is my setup here. Now, I can explicitly compute the integral with respect to the thickness because nothing depends on the thickness by uh, definition or assumption. So I'm going to end up with a t here when I do that integral with respect to dt. And my arc length integral with respect to ds, that's a closed line arc integral. That's why I've used this symbol here. You'll notice that I have the product of t times tau here, so I can replace that with the shear flow and bring it out from underneath the integral sign because Q is a constant according to the calculation I did on the previous slide. Now, 
let's go ahead and look at this cross product term ER cross ES. Let me go ahead and represent ER in the EN ES basis. So the component of ER in the N direction is ER dot EN and the component of ER in the tangential direction is ER dot ES. So I just simply replaced ER by this expression here in the square brackets and I have the cross product with ES. So when I take that cross product with ES the second term is going to drop out because ES cross ES is zero and EN cross ES is going to give me EZ. So what I'm going to end up with is Q, this closed line integral R, ER dot EN integrated respect to the arc length times EZ. So I brought the EZ out from underneath the integral sign because it's a constant. Uh, ER I can also write in Cartesian form, that's just the position vector, so that's XEX plus YEY. So if I plug that in, I have Q, the closed line integral of XEX plus YEY dot EN DS times EZ. And I can now go ahead and use the divergence theorem to compute this integral here. So that tells me that if I, I'm going to replace the line integral with an area integral. So this is an, the enclosed area, that's why there's that E on the A, of the divergence of whatever is dotted with EN. So that's the divergence theorem. So I have the divergence of XEX plus YEY DA integrating over the interior area of the tube times EZ. Well, the divergence is, is straightforward to calculate. That's going to be the derivative of x with respect to x plus y with respect to y, which is equal to 2. So I find out after this somewhat lengthy calculation here that the torque about the z-axis is equal to the shear flow times twice the enclosed area times EZ. So I can remove the EZ and I find that the shear flow is always related to the internal torque T by dividing by twice the enclosed area of the tube. And then if I want I can also connect that to the shear stresses simply by dividing by the thickness of the wall. So I find that the shear stress at any location alpha on the cross section is equal to the internal torque T divided by twice the enclosed area 2AE divided by the thickness at that angle. So this gives me the uh, the connection between torques and shear stresses and it goes via the shear flow, namely the shear flow is constant on, it, on any cross section due to the thinness assumption. Now for kinematics let's go ahead and look at the elastic case. So let me go ahead and consider a thin wall tube subjected to an end torque T hat and I'm going to go ahead and use energy to kind of get to the kinematics. So this won't be a, a particularly general kinematic result. It's going to rely on the system being elastic. So if I apply an end torque onto the tube, it's going to have a rotation theta and the work in is going to be one half t hat theta. So this is strictly linear elastic, what I'm going to assume here. Uh, now the work stored in the tube is going to be the integral of one half tau squared over g over the volume of material in the tube. So that's the strain energy density, one half tau squared over g. There's just one shear stress, that's the tau zs. And we have expressions for tau, so let's go ahead and, and plug those in. So the volume integral I'm going to replace with an integral along the length of the tube, so from 0 to L with respect to z. I'll explicitly integrate across the thickness, everything's a constant, so I'll just have t there. And then I'll be left with the closed line integral with respect to S. So that gives me the volume integral of the strain energy density, one half tau squared over G. Um, I can plug in for tau. Tau is T over uh, the twice the enclosed area divided by the thickness, so or T hat rather. So I plugged in for that here. So I have T hat squared divided by G and then I have four AE squared, thickness squared, and then I have this thickness here which started up here. Okay, And everything is a constant with respect to s and z in this calculation. So the, the integral with respect to z gives me a length. And then I can bring out all of these terms here from underneath the integral sign. Now I'm just left with the closed line integral of 1 over the thickness of the two. So that's the work stored. Let me go ahead and set that equal 
to the work in. And if I do that, I can find out that the twist rate along the tube, theta divided by L, is equal to t hat divided by 4ae squared, so that's the enclosed area of the tube, divided by g, and then this closed line integral of 1 over t ds. Uh, by analogy with the fact that the twist rate is equal to t over gj in the simple elastic case, we can also identify what the effective value of gj is for a thin wall tube. It's going to be 4ae squared g divided by the closed line integral from of 1 over t ds.